Okay, I want to help. I want to start a relay. Should I uh, kick a, uh, to start an exit relay in my home, or what do you need? What do you? What, what can I do with my hardware for you? I think I think um, exit relay at home is not a really good idea, because. Um, <clears throat> Your ISP might um, contact you about abuse, and it might block your home, your, your home network, and uh, the things of from your family as well. So, I think um, if you want to start having just a normal relay and not an exit relay, might be a good learning experience. And then, uh, yeah. Sorry, that one, from that one. So we also have the concept of bridges, which are basically relays, which are not public. You could see it as like, you know, a hidden relay, which are used for censored users. And, you know, for a relay, we want it to be online very constantly. It shouldn't, you know, go up and down and up and down because it's not very good for the network. So if you have a little bit of a flaky connection, it might be easier to just start a bridge. And I think you can actually do that in, in Tor browser, right? Uh, or you could do that? Mm. No? Not easily. Not easily. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but still, it might be the best option. Yeah, right? that's true. Yeah. Okay, so for entry level, do go with a bridge. If you're a, a bit more a, 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 a better connection at home and you want to mm. commit to this a long term, then go for a relay. And what are the requirements for actually becoming an exit node? What what would it require? Is it, are we talking about hosting and uh, a dedicated? Uh, Right, so uh, I would say you should have a plan for what happens if you get abuse complaints, right? So for example, uh, we were starting to start one at my university in Karlstadt and we already have a, you know, a lawyer who would take care of that for us. Uh, or if you do it at a data center, your ISP might be able to do that for you and maybe they drop you an angry email <coughs> if they have to do it for you. But the important thing is you shouldn't be you know, on your own if that happens and uh, yeah, if things go badly. So it also depends on how much do you exit, right? Because we have different policies. Nobody exits port 25 for SMTP because you're basically uh, sending spam, right? So that is being ruled out. So we have different exit policies. And if you reduce it a lot, uh, you actually don't get a lot of abuse complaints. I don't know. Do. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, so we have basically a minimum threshold which is kind of low, like a couple hundred kilobytes. Below that, your relay is practically useless. Mm -hmm. And apart <coughs> from that, uh, the more the better. So, you know, if you have 100 megabit, that would be pretty cool. Uh, if it's less than that, it might still be useful. And the thing is, the more you relay, the more CPU you're gonna need. So a Raspberry might not make you very happy and probably also not the Raspberry. Uh, so, you know, the more uh, dedicated power you have, the better. And, you know, we have uh, some really fast relays which have to go to great lengths uh, to, to keep that up. For example, modern Intel, Intel CPUs have some speed up for the AES operations, which would help you in order to relay more traffic. So yeah, the more the better, uh, at least I would say a couple hundred kilobytes would be really useful to the network. But yeah, a Raspberry might be a little bit too, uh, too slow for that. I'd like to ask you about the consensus. Uh, you said that you need at least 50% in order to leave something. But the example you gave, you were only giving three, three nodes with the flag enable, which is less than that. Uh, yeah, for <coughs> that exit, we only have three out of the total of nine. So for for most flags, it's you know uh, nine which vote, but for bad exit, it's only three. Because you know the reason for that is we need to be flexible to some degree, right? Uh, and if you have to go to five relay operators every time this happens, it's going to get a little bit annoying for everybody involved. So it's a little bit of a trade-off, right? We want to be fast, but at the same time, we still want to distribute the trust. 
and three seems quite good, right? Because as long as we can reach two relay operators in a reasonable amount of time, we're fine. And that's usually the case. Yeah. Uh, are those three in different jurisdictions? Um, they, they are. are actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the one is in Austria, one is in Germany, one is in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I read, I'm not sure if I remember this correctly, but uh, the Tor network does not try to protect against an attacker who has some kind of hypothesis about uh, the identity of some user, like the attacker monitors what goes into a, your entry relay and what comes out of the exit relay, and then through timing and size and stuff could uh, sort of easily confirm his idea that uh, you are this particular user. Is, uh, is this true? And if so, is this... Uh, is the intention to keep this assumption that these attackers are not considered, or uh, is the plan to do something against that? So, so should I take it? Yeah. So the thing is, um, there's there are two kind of a two kinds of anonymity networks you have. You have so called low latency and high latency anonymity networks, and um, those uh, low latency anonymity networks like Tor are used for web browsing and interactive messaging and things. And um, <clears throat> they are not um, up to these kind of attackers, which can monitor <coughs> before their first node and after the uh, last node. So um, this kind of traffic analysis um, is one of the things that, ex that Tor excludes out of this threat model. Because in order to uh, cope with this attack, you usually have to have some kind of smart dummy traffic thing where you re send constantly traffic through the network and your stream is basically hiding uh, in this dummy traffic and this is quite costly um, which is basically not usable if you have a low latency anonymity network because then your browsing your instant messaging um, is not usable anymore because due to all this dummy traffic so um, there are plans um, to to work on this issue, there's um, one uh, PhD student who is writing uh, his dissertation on how we can maybe uh, have a smart um, dummy traffic strategy up to the uh, um, middle node uh, in a way that we still be able to uh, serve the web anonymously <coughs> and at least throughout some forms of this traffic analysis. analysis. But it's a huge open research topic uh, currently. And um, some people are even uh, debating that um, this kind of de-anonymization is really working uh, in practice. I mean, this is, the math is, uh, is clear that it's generally possible to make this kind of correlation. But maybe the, the load and the noise on the Tor network is so huge currently that it's um, Give, is giving you just a huge false positive um, rate and makes this kind of attack useless. But it's, it's, it's sort of speculation and um, it's an open research topic. Currently we, we say we are not safe against um, such kind of an attack with such huge uh, resources. There is an example of, of a confirmation attack that I don't think Tor can do anything to, to actually hide against, which is uh, what happened to Jeremy Hammond to make him, uh, when, when they confirmed that Jeremy Hammond was actually who he was. Uh, so they had identified him, they had a suspicion, they looked at IRC where he was logged in, they found his house, they cut the power to the house, and he dropped off IRC. So in a low latency network, network you will never be able to protect against that kind of confirmation. That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm curious about uh, uh, DPI and, and uh, censorship. So the, uh, the, the current state of the art would be uh, OPS4, which is based on Philips uh, Scramble Suit. Uh, and uh, my, my question is, uh, uh, what <coughs> do you foresee any attacks by probably the Chinese to, to uh, uh, yeah, to, to crack OS4. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it can't be cracked in the same way that, that you can dynamically detect OS2 servers, but mm -hmm. what can you do against OS4? Right, so I wouldn't say probably the Chinese because I think Procera is based in Sweden, right? Or it used to be based, so you, you can never know where it's coming from. 
<laughs> but yeah, it, it's hard to say because usually what happens is things you do not anticipate. So we had a lot of smart designs uh, which worked in Iran, for example. And then what they did at some point was the very simple thing of just cutting TCP connections or terminating <coughs> them after 60 seconds. And nobody saw that coming. So, you know, you tunnel your traffic happily, you surf the web, and after 60 seconds it was over. Uh, and <coughs> yeah, it's just an example of the general idea of, you know, they tend to not do what we think they will do because you know what we what we think they will do is the hard thing to do and what you're facing is not some uh you know powerful adversary with highly you know extremely smart people what you have is people who just try to get their job done as easily as possible and to please their their boss basically and i think they're actually doing a good job at that because many of the attacks we are seeing are you know surprising but they work pretty well actually so yeah i don't think i can give any any smart predictions about that i think we're doing kind of good now especially with things like meek uh, so for those of you who don't know it's a really cool system where you can tunnel traffic over cloud infrastructure like google for example because it makes use of the way uh, uh, basically content delivery networks work uh, so this is something which is used in tor and in many other circumvention systems too like lantern and Psyphon. And uh, it, it looks pretty promising, and maybe it's going to be broken at some point, but it will probably be broken in a way we couldn't really anticipate. So, yeah, I'm sorry that I don't have a better answer to this. <coughs> but, and, and they can always, um, like, um, if they are high holidays or things, they can just um, put all those traffic in the trash and interrupt it because they can't decipher it. It's always the option they have like uh, disrupting things and making it really annoying for users um, and then you can have the best scheme in the world but it's still not usable because users are saying well I can't use it I can only use it um, half a minute a day or what and then go away with it so it's hard hard problem mm -hmm. Uh, you were speaking about end-to-end -end encryption on the Torium sites. Uh, how end-to-end -end it is? Hidden services? Yeah, for example, if you use a cell, you know that the end-to-end -end encryps encryption goes from the browser or whatever you're using to connect <coughs> to most likely the web server unless they are using one of these SSL aggregator mm -hmm. uh, systems. So how it is for them? Uh, well, end-to-end -end basically means Tor-to-Tor, -to -tor, which could be end-to-end, -end, but not necessarily, right? Because uh, Tor is a SOX proxy, and SOX is a network protocol. So if you're you know, having Tor on one machine and you're connecting to it over SOX from a different <coughs> machine, then there is a small gap between the end-to-end -end encryption. But as long as you have both on the same computer, uh, it doesn't really traverse the network in clear text. Does that make sense? I think this is one of the things um, Facebook is concerned about because mm. um, the traffic is terminating on their Tor hidden service box and then it has to be rerouted to, uh, into their <coughs> internal infrastructure to uh, get all the things loaded. So there is, a, there is maybe a small gap, yes, that's true. But um, at least to the, you can be sure that you're reaching Facebook um, in an unmodified way. Yeah, so the reason for that is what we call self-authenticated names, right? Because if you look at hidden service names, they're a little bit hard to remember. It's not as easy as Facebook.com. It's basically a, a lot of long, difficult to remember digits and stuff. And the reason for that is what you're seeing <coughs> is not what somebody chose. It's just the hash of a, of a public key, right? Uh, which means that it can authenticate itself, which is really cool, but it comes at the cost of... It's hard to remember it, right? And it's funny because Facebook did a good job at still designing it in a way that you can kind of remember it, which was basically luck for them. They just tried to compute many, many public keys. And then by uh, what was really a lot of luck, I think they got one which sounds like an actual domain name. And everybody thought, oh, my God, they just broke hidden services. They should never have a, you know, a name like that. But no, they were just really, really lucky. So. <coughs> Mm -hmm. uh, you're mentioning that you can detect uh, if the exit node is doing something with traffic. 
but I was wondering, how can you detect if it's just uh, sniffing the traffic? And ah, yeah. Uh, that's a good question. So if somebody is only sniffing and doing nothing else, then you can't. But what people usually do is they go a little bit further, right? So what I did a couple of days ago is I fetched a web page uh, and over every single exit relay, I passed a unique identifier. And then a couple of minutes later, so I did that for every single exit relay. And what you would expect in your logs is to see every request only once from the exit relay. And for one exit relay, I saw it twice. Uh, from a relay in Japan <coughs> and that was funny because it was first the exit relay and then it was another IP address also from Japan which was not a relay mm -hmm. so it looked like somebody who was running this relay in Japan uh, basically just tried to fetch the same site again which was called uh, passwords.txt because you know I wanted to encourage people to actually fetch it <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is one way how you can uh, catch something like that uh, you told us that you were going to, you, well, you were aiming on keeping the current sort of user model, that is using the Tor browser as, as the main source for for browsing the nets uh, anonymously. Uh, I've been seeing a lot of activity on the internet lately using a different uh, user model, that is creating some sort of device, a router or a dongle. There's been Kickstarter projects, there's been the portal project uh, from the group, and there's, uh, I think, Ad Adafruit has some, some uh, uh, project that we can, you can create an access point through your Raspberry Pi uh, to sort of create uh, a persistent device in your home that you can easily connect to and that you cannot, um, excuse the word, they may fuck up the connection <laughs> in any way. Do, have you any thoughts on that user model? Is that a good or bad way to go about things? Mm. Yeah, this is one of the directions we are currently investigating. There are prototypes out there by some of the Tor people who developed uh, Tor routers and we are trying to to find a way to um, to, to post the, uh, the experiences we had actually with um, developing these kind of systems and <coughs> giving um, hints to the community how we could um, further um, develop in this, re in this regard. So this is a hot topic and um, um, there are some Tor folks working on these things. So this is a legitimate uh, user model, having um, all your traffic routed um, in a secret way through Tor, be it at your home or anywhere else. Uh, just one more point. It's also really hard to get right because mm -hmm. we've That's seen right. things which got into production, which were being sold, and which turn out to be horribly broken. And one example is safe plug. Yeah, safe plug. So, mm -hmm. Right. So it's one of those things you plug it in, and then you can just basically use it like a gateway, right? And it transparently tunnels everything over Tor. And we looked into it, and it turns out that an exit relay would be able to, you know, by manipulating the traffic, trigger an update of the safe plug thing, which is sitting on the client side. And then it could basically break into the HTTPS and inject yeah, a binary, which then gets executed on the user side. So you could basically on the fly identify and own uh, safe plug users. And that's basically a good example of how you shouldn't do it. Was that the Kickstarter project that was pulled? I, I think that's a different one. Okay, that's <laughs> a different one. It's a different one. But yeah, I think the reason we, I mean, it's a cool concept, but we haven't really seen a successful one yet because it's really hard to do, harder than most people think. Tor has actually full support for transparent proxy, at least on Linux systems. You can just enable it with a video, both for IP version 4 and IP version 6. I have to write the patches for IP version 6, that's why I know. Uh, and the most important thing you should take into account there is that uh, if you are going to redirect traffic, you will not be able to use UDP traffic at all because uh, Tor has no support for it. So that's a problem you should take into account uh, mm -hmm. when you're networks using Tor as transparent for it. And it's usually when mo you are more likely to fuck up if you try to do that. Yeah. Okay, I have another question. So, um, <laughs> Uh, I, I've, I've been thinking about how 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 much would it take to to uh, to de-anonymize a user where you don't have 
uh, a hypothesis uh, about the, the user's location. And um, so if, uh, obviously I can't uh, start running 3,000 exit relays uh, in one day. Uh, and uh, obviously they can't be in the same, on the same subnet uh, because that would be an obvious cluster. But if I <coughs> distributed them evenly over uh, a bunch of uh, cloud providers and uh, different data centers, probably data centers because I want mm -hmm. as much traffic as possible, um, and then did this over uh, a period of two years. Mm -hmm. uh, since you have 7,000 relays and only about 1,000 a, a exit relays, mm -hmm. wouldn't then uh, wouldn't it, uh, so my previous uh, thought was that you would need to be the NSA because you need a global a view, of, a global view mm -hmm. of the internet. But what you actually need, isn't it only a, a global view of, a, a good enough view of the uh, Tor network. So if I started 3000 relays over a period of two years, mm -hmm. uh, what, would, would, would that break Tor and if so on, how, how much would it cost? <laughs> you want to take that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think a part of the answer is what comes down to guard relays. So those are basically the first ones you choose. And right now, if you start a new bra uh, if you start Tor, it picks, is it three, four mm. guard relays? I think it's three. Mm, um, yeah, but we are on the way to move yeah. to one guard. Exactly. So those are basically a set of three computers which you only use as the first top, right? Only three and not any <coughs> other one. And uh, somebody basically did some simulations uh, and tried to figure out, if the, is this even a good idea, right? Because sometimes it's, it's really hard to argue about the security properties. And it looks like it's not a bad idea, but it could be better. So I think there are some proposals to move to only one now, to one guard. Uh, which should make it harder, right? Because uh, you have a lot of relays, but y if you don't happen to have the single one you need, uh, then it's harder for you. So I think, I mean, if you have 3,000 relays, you probably, yeah, we have a lot of other issues, but um, it depends on a lot of things, I guess, where <laughs> in the network you are and how could you maybe trigger the user to, you know, to change the card or something like that. So, yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, the answer is always, you know, it depends on your threat model and stuff. And yeah, in, in that case too, but you're probably pretty successful already if you manage to run 3000 relays. And it's, um, it's usually um, as well the case that we try to, um, to keep track of people. Um, like, do, they, do these their servers behave in the same way or do they have um, things like, um, the same contact information, for instance, you would you would spoof this probably, right? So you wouldn't say it's 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 Frederick all the time, because it would give would give you obviously obviously um, some uh, some bad bad things. But um, there are um, other non-technical means, like trying to get in touch with people who are running who are running huge relays and large clusters of relay or yeah, a bunch of relays. Um, but at the end, yeah, if you are really sneaky, that could be uh, hard to detect and have some impact on the Tor network. But wouldn't it be easier to break it by, by getting 7,000 computers small next to each one of the existing relays instead of getting 3,000 new ones? Mm. Uh, maybe. I mean, you know, there are, that's a good point, but there are other points to consider. For example, we are only talking about relays here, right? About the first and the last one. But what about the path between the client and the relay and the exit relay and the destination? I mean, this is a long path in the network, which is going maybe all around the world. And now consider people who have access to BGP routers and who are able to just hijack parts of the Internet without people noticing and redirecting parts of it to them. So uh, this is something which for a long time wasn't really considered that, you know, ISPs, for example, always control your first hop, right? And if you are going basically over your ISP and visit the website of your ISP over Tor, it's not going to help you, right? Because your ISP sees 
uh, the beginning and the end of your com uh, communication. They can do what is called end-to-end -end traffic correlation. And this is yeah a difficult thing to consider, right? And good luck trying to teach that to users because they just know that they're using Tor and they're going to be safe. But that's not universally true because yeah it depends on a lot of really nasty networking issues we're facing on the internet just because it's poorly designed in many ways.